So, hello everyone. This is EE698G. We are now at lecture two. So, in the last class, we did a quick derivation for the delay of an inverter. Specifically, we were looking at the calculation of TP high to low of an inverter. And the model we used was this. PMOS was in cutoff. We had a current source with some value of current, a nonlinear current, of course, be modeling the current of the NMOS transistor, and then a capacitor, the load capacitor, CM. And for modeling this current, we relied on the ID versus VDS curve of the NMOS transistor. So our current had a waveform that looked like this. Right, so this node is V naught. So VDS of the NMOS transistor is now V naught, and we made an assumption in deriving this. Do you remember the assumption? We made multiple assumptions, but we made something with respect to this current wave. So we assumed that if this is our VDD and this is the VDD minus VTN point. We assumed that the VDD by two was somewhere here, right? And because of this, we saw that our integration had to go within this region. So we got the expression for TPHL as follows. So I'm just writing down the integration not the final expression. So we had to integrate from VDD to VDD by two capacitance divided by minus of this I minus because the current is being pulled out of the capacitor and integration with respect to V naught, right? And this is now basically the current in saturation. So now if this assumption was not valid, that is, let's say we knew that our VDD by two was occurring here. I'm just drawing a sample case now. And the VDD minus VTN was occurring here. So which means I have to draw VDD closer. It's not to scale, but the idea is what if VDD minus VTN was greater than VDD by two, okay? So I just wanted to show you how to write this integral. I'm sure you know already. So if VDD minus VTN is greater than VDD by two, how should I write this integral? What should I do? Our integration region is here. I have to break the integration, right? So I'll now have two integrals. So the first integral will go from VDD to VDD minus VTN. And this is capacitance divided by minus of the current and saturation. And the second integral will now go from VDD minus VTN to VDD by two, CL by the current linear region. Okay. So now depending upon the relative values of VDD by two and VDD minus VTN, we'll have to do one of these integrals. But even without doing these integrals, what you can clearly see is this. Our TPHL is some function of the ratio of CL by charging and discharging current. So if I do something to increase this ratio, my delay will increase. If I reduce this ratio, my delay will reduce. And that makes intuitive sense as well, right? Okay, so now if this is clear, so now we have an inverter. We know how to look at its propagation delay, high to low, low to high, TR and TL. I cascade two inverters. What will I get? I get a buffer. And even for this buffer, I will be able to characterize its propagation delays. And if I cascade multiple buffers, then this becomes a delay line, right? Okay, 
So if one buffer had a delay TP, and if I put identical buffers, what comment can I make about the total delay? For TP? So in writing this, I have actually assumed that the driver seen by this first buffer is an identical driver. And the last stage also sees an identical load. So the capacitance offered by the last stage, the same as the capacitance seen by these intermediate nodes, only that will ensure that the delay is seen. Similarly, the driver also has to be identical. So now let me name them. So this is N1. Let this node be N1, N2, N3, and finally out. Okay, so once we have a delay line like this, it gives us some interesting results. So for example, let's say my N1 is a clock. Why do we need identical drivers? Okay, good question. So let's say I have a buffer, right? So there is some rising edge and corresponding to that, I have a rising edge. Now the rising edge here, will be a function of the drive strength as well as the capacitance. This is why you need to have an identical load in the last stage, right? The reason for identical driver is this. This rising edge is also a function of the time taken for the input to rise. So that will be a function of the current available here and the input capacitance here, right? So that way we have to actually match both the driver as well as the output load. So that's why we need an identical driver in the beginning. If I don't have this, then it is not correct to say that all of them will have equal delays. So this one, let's say I didn't have the same driver here for the first in, first buffer. So all the others may have identical delays, but the first one could potentially have a different delay. Okay? So to make this statement of 4TP, I actually need identical drives. Okay. So now my TP will be a delayed, sorry, in N1 will be a delayed version of TP, uh, of N1. So let's say this is my N1. So N2 is again delayed version. So it will look like this. N3 will be delayed by one more TP. And finally, out will be del again a delayed version of this. So here, the delay between the rising edges is now TP. So now if I look at all these clock phases, clock waveforms, we see that all of them have the same frequency, right? The only difference is they are all delayed versions of the same clock. Their rising edges are occurring at different instances. So in other words, they are all different phases of the same clock. So we call these as clock phases. Now, if you have clock phases available in the system, it has multiple uses. So let me give you an example of an application where clock phases are used in a very clever manner. So let me first build up to that application. So let's say I have a laser pulse, okay? I shine this laser pulse, it goes, hits the wall, and it comes back, and I detect the time of arrival of the laser pulse. So there is some time it takes for the laser pulse to traverse this distance, right? I know the velocity of light. So if I know the time of flight of this laser pulse, given that I know the velocity, I can calculate the distance, right? So this is called as time of flight measurements. Okay, this concept is actually used in several applications. So now what we do in the electronics is when we generate this laser pulse, when this, when this laser pulse starts from my device, I create a start signal. So let's say this is my start signal. And once my sensor detects the returning laser pulse, we will generate a stop signal within the electronics. Okay. Now, all that I have to do is measure this time interval. Let me call this as some T in. So can you tell me what is the easiest way to measure a time interval? I want to measure 
for this time interval, what can I possibly do? Count. Ah, so basically, so you said counter. So what the counter is going to do is count the clock edges, right? So basically, I could use a clock and count the number of clock edges. So let me increase the time interval. Now let's say this clock had a period of T ref. Then I count the number of clock cycles. So this is the first clock period, second clock period, and that's it, right? I have only two complete clock periods in this. So now I could report this delay. Let me call this as some TD1. This is my estimate of TN. This will be equal to two times T ref, correct? Where two is now a digital code that I can give as an output. So basically, this is one form of implementing a time to digital converter. Or in short, this is called as a TDC. Okay. So the problem now is I'm making an error in doing this, correct? So I am quantizing this time interval in terms of TRF. And I have made an error here. So let me show this as some delta. And this error could be anywhere between 0 to TRF. This is clear. So in other words, my resolution is only TRF. I will not be able to resolve two events that is closer than TRF. It has to be greater than TRF to, for me to be able to say it is at least one TRF. OK, so next question. Let's say I want to improve the resolution. What should I do? I can increase the frequency, right? So then I could use a second clock, which let's say has a smaller time period. And then I can measure the number of clock cycles in between these two events. And then I can report my second estimate. So this will be some N2, which is now my digital code into TRF2. Plus we will make some error and this error can vary between zero to TRF2. And if TRF2 is a smaller value, now my resolution is better. Is this clear? Okay. So now let me come to the third part. Let's say a customer comes and tells us that they need a resolution of 100 picosecond, which means what should our clock frequency be? So clock period should be 100 picosecond. So what should be the frequency? Huh. Can I? 10 gigahertz. So this is definitely on the higher side, right? It might be possible to implement such a, a circuit, but it's going to consume a lot of power. It's going to heat up and it will be very messy. Okay. So now let me pose this as a problem. To you. you can form small groups. Feel free to walk around and discuss and see if you can come up with a solution. So what you have to do is you have to come up with a TDC architecture. The resolution required is 100 picosecond. Assume that a 10 gigahertz clock is not available. Assume that the clock available is smaller than or equal to one gigahertz, okay? All that you have is a buffer whose delay is now 100 picosecond. So you have a buffer whose delay is 100 picosecond. You have to achieve a TDC that has a res resolution of 100 picosecond. You can replicate this buffer as many number of times as you require. So feel free to discuss. We'll take five minutes on this. You can form small groups of two or three. And once you have some solution, we can discuss that on the board, okay? Feel free to move around the class, turn the chairs as required. And all. Okay, so let me give you one solution. You have a result ready? And then come. So like most of you did, I'm going to pass my start. 
through a buffer chain. Okay, and I'm going to call these points as N1, N2, N3, etc. So now let me sketch out these waveforms. So this is N1, N2, N3, let me also sketch N4. So this has been the common uh, idea behind all these logics, right? And now I'm simply going to compare the stop signal with these waveforms, correct? So in comparing, I can simply look at the value. So if I look at this sequence, this is now one, 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 zero. So for the next sequence also, so if I had N5, this is also going to be zero, right? So basically at the instant at which stop is occurring, I need to sample the values of all these waveforms. Does any circuit come to your mind that can sample the value at the instant and edges occurring? D flip flop, right? So basically the circuit we can use is this. So I have, so I have used the stop to sample, right? So I can have my start signal. I will feed this to the D of a flop. And I will use the stop here. Okay, so then I pass it through one buffer and I repeat the process. And I can have as many delay elements as required with as many comparisons as required. So let's say this output is O1, this is O2, this is O3, let's say we have O4, et cetera. So now if I were to look at the sequence of O1, O2, O3, O4, et cetera, up to ON, how would the sequence look like? This will be a sequence of ones followed by a sequence of zeros. And the number of ones here is basically my TDC output. This is clear. So actually very good attempt. All of you have caught on to the right logic. This is just a slightly simpler implementation. Okay, if this is clear, now I'm going to give you a different implementation. And you have to tell me whether this can work as a TDC. And if it can work as a TDC, you have to tell me how to find the output based on the sequence, okay? So this is our second exercise. Let's say this time I put my stop as the D input. And I'm going to use the start signal to sample. This is O1. Etc. So question is, can this work as a TDC? And second part, if it can work as a TDC, then you have to tell me what the how to find the output in terms of O1, O2, O3, etc. Again, you can try in the groups. So again, uh, similar structure, but I'm going to put buffers in the stop part now. Let's say I sample using the start. 
So this is my oven. I have one buffer. And so forth. So again, same question. Will this work as a TDC? If so, then what is the output? So you can think about this. It will not work. Ah, okay, so you can think about this and confirm the answer. Okay. So now in doing Okay, before I move on. So these implementations that we saw, these are actually called as flash TDC. There are, you see that there are several ways in which you can implement a time to digital converter, much like how you can implement an ADC in several ways. So this is equivalent to a flash ADC in the sense that you are comparing uh, the input with some reference. In flash, ADC, in flash ADC, it's the input voltage being compared to fractions of reference voltage. Here we are comparing the input time interval to multiples of some known reference time, correct? And the known reference time is a 100 picosecond buffer. So this is one of the easiest TDCs to implement. So now let's talk about this 100 picosecond buffer. How easy or difficult do you think it will be to implement a buffer with 100 picosecond? So a delay of 100 picosecond is actually not very difficult, especially the current state of the uh, technology. Huh. Huh. So uh, as you said, 100 picosecond is not going to be difficult to achieve. But the problem comes in achieving this 100 picosecond in a reliable manner. Because the delays on the chip are functions of transistor properties and the interconnect properties. And it's very difficult to achieve a particular property for a transistor or a capacitor. So basically, I'm going to talk about the variations that can occur on a chip. So let's talk about process, voltage, and temperature variations. This is in short called as PVT variations. I'm sure you would have heard of the term. So let me still recap the basics. Now, all our dyes are going to be fabricated on a silicon wafer. The wafer is roughly 300 millimeter in diameter, so roughly a 30 centimeter scale. Now, let me show you the image of a wafer. So I took this picture from a TSMC website, and you can see that the single wafer has been divided into multiple dyes. Right? So basically, one wafer is now going to be divided into multiple dyes. And then you can, once the whole thing is fabricated, they will dice and give us each die. Okay, so it's cut and we get the individual die. So now the properties of all these dies are not going to be seen. Basically, the transistor properties in a die, let's say somewhere here, is going to be very different from the transistor properties in a die somewhere here. So let's say I pick up some die number one and say I pick up die number 400 from here. And let's look at how the variations can occur. So let's say I picked up all the NMOS transistors in die number one. I looked at this threshold voltage and I plotted the histogram, right? So I would get a waveform similar to this. So this is going to be a Gaussian distribution with some mean value, let me call it as VTH1. So if I plot for die number 500, uh, sorry, 400, what do you expect to see? Yeah, so you will see that the uh, curve still has a Gaussian distribution, but the mean will be shifted. Okay, 
And now this shift happens due to various reasons, such as uh, at the center of the wafer, you are more likely to get higher uh, iron implantation concentration than at the periphery. So similarly, there'll be differences in etching also. So all of these differences are going to cause a shift in the mean for the uh, VTH of all the transistors in the uh, uh, die. So now this variation, this shift in the mean is what we call as the inter-die variation. It's also called as die-to-die -die variation. in short D2D. But we designers know it by a different name. What is that name? We call this as process variation. So if I fabricate 100 chips, it's all of these chips could have a different VTH, right? So similarly, even within the same die, as you can see, the VTH is not same, there is some variation. And this is called as intra-die variation. Or it's also called as within-die variation. Sometimes abbreviated as WID, within-die variation. So now this within die variation can happen due to two reasons. So let's say within a die, I have a transistor sitting in one corner and another transistor sitting in another corner. So they are separated by a large distance, especially if your chip is very large. So now all the reasons I mentioned for having this process corner variation, they are true within a die as well, right? So this sort of variation is called as systematic variation. And the difference in the properties will increase if the transistor distance, the distance with which the uh, transistors are kept is very large. Okay. The second type of variation is called as random variation. And this can happen to two transistors that are placed close to each other as well. And this happens because of the randomness in the number of dopant atoms getting put into the diffusion region. Right. So even if a lot of things are matched equally. There is still some randomness involved in the number of dopant atoms in the diffusion region. So these small variations is what causes this random variation. So now as designers, what do we call this intra-die variation? So we say call variations within the die as mismatch between the transistors. Okay, so now of course it's not possible to match all the transistors within the die, mismatches will happen. However, it is possible to match a couple of transistors. So we will put those transistors together, follow certain design techniques, and we can achieve a relatively good matching between a couple of transistors, okay? And this, you, as you'll see, is a very important point. So now all of these terms, die to die variation, process variation, this is something that we will have to live with. As designers, we have no control over it. Within a die, you can match a couple of transistors, but between two dies, there isn't much we can do. So any technique that we come up with will have to work even in the presence of process variations. And in general, these effects that result in different properties from one die to another are together lumped in terms of the transistor speed. So now we say a transistor can either be slow or it could have a typical speed or it could be fast. So this basically relates to how the variations in BTH, mu, COX, et cetera, is going to affect the transistor speed. And it's not necessary that both NMOS and PMOS come in the same process corner. They can independently be in different corners. So then we can sketch out this very qualitative diagram. So my NMOS can be fast, say slow or fast. Similarly, my PMOS 
can also be slow or fast. So if my NMOS and PMOS come under typical conditions, what do we call that process corner? You have seen this. I mean, I think all of you have seen this. So you guys designed, right? What do you call that model file? Huh. So TT corner? Yeah. So if both NMOS and PMOS are in typical corner, common terminology is to say that this uh, die has come in TT corner. So similarly, if PMOS and NMOS are in slow corner, we say this is in SS corner. Similarly, if both are fast, they are in SF corner. So our PMOS could be slow and NMOS could be fast. So then this is FS corner. And then finally, we have the SF corner. So this is a common terminology used, but in some model files, you see that they will say worst one or best one, et cetera. So for uh, PMOS being slow, they'll call it as worst one because it takes more time for a node to charge through PMOS. Okay, so now I've been calling these as corners. The reason for calling them as corners is because they form the corners of a box as shown here. Okay, and it's up to the foundry to make sure that the transistor properties lie within this corner. So they fine tune their fabrication process and guarantee that the transistor properties are going to be well within this box. And then they give us designers the model files for all these corners. So now if we have to design a TDC, we will have to make sure that our TDC works in all these corners by simulating use, by simulating using the model files for these corners. Is this clear? Okay, so now we started with a 100 picosecond buffer. What comments can you make about this 100 picosecond value now that you know about the process corners? Let's say I designed for 100 picosecond a typical corner. I made 100 chips and I sold it to the customer. Now it's not necessary that, the, that all 100 chips have come out in the typical corner. Correct. Some of them could have come out in FF corner, which means the delay could be lesser than 100 picosecond. Let's say 80 picosecond. Some of the dice might have been in the slow corner, SS corner. Then the delay could be, let's say, around 130 picosecond. So we are basically telling our customer, here is the TDC, but we don't know what its resolution is. It could be anywhere between 80 to 130 picoseconds. That is just bad design, right? So like I said, whatever TDC implementation we are going to do, we will have to ensure that the method is going to work irrespective of these process variations. So this is the first of the evils. Now let's talk about voltage variations. Okay, so let's assume that we are working with a technology where the supply voltage is supposed to be 1.8 volt. Let's say we designed for 1.8 volt and we got the buffer delay to be 100 picoseconds. So how it will eventually look like is this. So you'll have a die. You'll have this inverter sitting in some corner within the die. Now to provide supply to this, you're going to route a metal line to it. Now this die is going to be packaged in something. So packaging is done to protect the die and you will have some connection from the die to the package boundary. And then you will put this die on a PCB. So there will be some PCB trace. And eventually, there will be some voltage regulator on the PCB. Okay. So now you designed with the intention of giving a 1.8 volt here. Correct. But this voltage regulator would have some issue. That is one possibility. The more common possibility is this is your VDD line, right? So this is going to draw very large currents. However, it is a metal line, which means it will have some finite resistance. And once you have a finite resistance, you will have some drop across this line given by the current it draws into its resistance. So you will definitely have some drop in this line. Usually the drop is more critical within the chip, okay? Which means, Though you intended to give 1.8 volt here, instead of 1.8 volt, your inverter might be seeing, let's say 1.75 volt. Your delay will change. It's not 100 picosecond anymore. 
Therefore, as designers, we have to make sure that even with some variation in VDD, our design principles as in our performance doesn't change. Okay. So I'm not saying that you design for 1.8 volt and make sure that it works for 1.2 volt also. That is such a large change. That is not what I'm saying. So all that you have to make sure is that your design works at least for 10 percentage variation in VD. And this is a very common thing to do in IC design. So for example, if you wanted to work with 1.8 volt, you will also simulate for 10 percentage variation. So it's 1.8 volt plus or minus 180 millivolt. And you make sure that it works even with this variation. Okay. So again, we have to rethink about how to get our buffer to be 100 picosecond, even in the presence of voltage variation. Now, finally, let's move on to temperature. So your delay is a function of the charging discharging current, which is going to be a function of the mobility threshold voltage, etc. Now, as you change your temperature, your mobility and threshold voltage will change, which means now your delay has changed. So this is like telling the customer, here is the TDC. It has a nominal resolution of 100 picosecond, but you will get a different resolution if you measure it in January versus if you measure it in June, especially if you are in car. So again, this is also a bad design. So now we have to think of techniques as to how we can stabilize the delay of the buffer to 100 picosecond, even in presence of this PVT. So what do we generally do when we want to uh, match something in uh, analog circuits? What is our usual go-to solution? We see a problem in analog circuit, some voltage is not settling correctly. What is the first thing that we think of? Feedback. So let's see if we can use the principles of feedback to stabilize the delay. So what we now need is to compare this 100 picosecond to some known time reference. And then we'll see what parameter within the circuit we have to go and tweak such that the buffer delay remains 100 picosecond. Okay. So what can you think of as a time reference? A clock period, right? So I could use a clock period and then compare my buffer delay to this clock period and match them. But then we initially started by saying that it is not possible to get a, it's very difficult to get a 100 picosecond clock. So now instead of locking the buffer delay to one clock period, we will take multiple buffers, make it into a delay line, and we lock the total delay of the delay line to one clock period. Sounds reasonable? Okay, so now I take multiple buffers, Okay, so some n number of buffers, we'll keep it generic. And I make sure that the total delay of this buffer line, this delay line is one clock period by comparing it to the external clock period that is provided. So if it's a clock and if it is provided externally, it's actually quite easy to control that, right? So then what comments can you make about the delay of each buffer? T clock by n, provided that all the buffers are identical. So now, like I said before, it is possible to match a couple of transistors reasonably well. So it is actually quite possible to match a buffer delay line like this, provided we place them closely and do some circuit techniques. Okay, so then the delay of each buffer is going to be T clock by n. So now to get 100 picoseconds, I have to choose a proper T clock and an n. Okay, so now let's come to how we can lock this uh, delay lines delay to one clock period. So I'm going to sketch the waveforms of in and out. Let's say this is my input. And let's say this is my out signal. So right now it has some delay. It's not equal to one clock period. Okay, 
Let me number the edges. Let's say this is the first edge at the input. This is going to be the first edge at the output, the delayed version of this edge. Similarly, this is my second edge, third edge, etc. So now my aim is to make sure that this delay is how much? What should this delay be eventually? It has to be d clock because this is the delay of the delay line. So let me call this as some delta one now. Okay, let me also mark this region here. Once delta one tends to t clock, what happens to this region? It tends to zero, correct? So now let me start representing it in phase domain. So I want to make delta one equal to t clock, or in other words, I want to make this delta phi to be zero. Okay, so now that is my aim. I have to implement a circuit which will make this delta phi to zero. So basically, I have to make sure that the first edge of my output occurs at the same instant as the second edge of my input. Or to generalize it, any edge at the output should occur at the same time as the next edge at the input. So now let's see how to do that. So I take my delay line. So this consists of multiple buffers. So I have my output here. This is my input. I'm going to compare the input and the output edges. And then I'm going to detect this delta phi. Okay. Now, based on this delta phi, I will do some processing. We'll not worry about that yet. Okay. And based on the result, I have to go and change the delay of this delay line. Okay. So once I have to change this delay such that this delta phi tends to zero. So this is our negative feedback loop. Now, as you can see, this is not a regular delay line anymore. We want to be able to change its delay, which means this is now a variable delay line. It is also called as a tunable delay line because I'm tuning the delay. And generally, these delay lines are controlled, are tuned by UC voltage. So therefore, these are going to be voltage controlled delay lines. So all that it means is that this parameter here, which is our tuning signal, is going to be some voltage. So now for each PVT corner, there is some magic value of VC for which I will get T clock as the total delay here. If the PVT corner varies, if the temperature varies, this VC has to change. And the loop will make sure that this VC settles to the correct value such that the delay still remains as T clock so that the delta phi remains as zero. So now how this VC is set, the loop is going to take it. So now for each PVT corner, we should be able to give this VC continuously to the delay line, right? Which means we have to store this VC somewhere. And what is the best element to store a voltage? A capacitor. So that means I need to have a capacitor here. So this capacitor is going to have this VC stored across it. Now, the moment I have a capacitor, I will need to have some mechanism to push or pull charges into it, depending on delta phi. If the delta phi is non-zero, I will have to change the VC voltage, which means I have to either take away charge or push charge into it. So this basically has to push or pull charges into it. Okay. And this whole negative feedback loop is going to lock the total delay of this delay line to one clock period. So this loop has a very straightforward name. This is called as a delay locked loop or DL. So actually all the terminologies are very easy to remember. So this is the loop that is locking the delay of this VCDL of this delay line to one clock period. So any questions on this negative feedback loop? I know I have not put the technical terms yet, but generally any questions on the loop architecture?
Okay, so let me start filling in the technical details. So to detect this delta phi, I need to have a circuit called as phase detector. And you'll see that the most common architecture of phase detector used in the DLL is usually a phase detector called as phase frequency detector or a PFD. We will see its architecture in the coming class. Similarly, to push and pull charges out of this capacitor, we use a circuit called as the charge pump. Okay. So, all that this delay lock loop is doing is it is going to detect the phase using a phase detector. Based on the value of the delta phi detected, it is going to either dump charges into it or pull out charges. And eventually, this will settle to the right magic value of VC such that the overall delay of this delay line is one clock delay. So we still have to look into details of this variable delay line, phase detector, charge pump, etc. I think we can start with individual components in the next class. Okay, so if you have any other questions on this, I can take them. Okay, otherwise we can end this class.